It all started here, this day, this time, this moment. 65 years ago, it was a dream that grew to change mankind. And it all started here, November 2nd, 1920. Out of the empty air, filled with crackling and static, came a human voice, and the world would never be the same. The vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. Oh, stop right. Battle I'm interested to know, know Gracie. Gracie. Who's your choice? Me, oh, you George. You say this was their finest hour. Well, listen, the man is just about to see it. The Amos and Andy show. Hey, you. You ever played this number before, Bub? Played it. I yeah. made it. Interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Number Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. 1941. A date which will live. Ohio Silver, the Lone Ranger. Mr. Hiroshima. So, ladies and germs, ladies and gentlemen, it's a bird. It's a plane. The Queen. 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 The Queen.
Hold up close to the wireless transmitter. Soon, Conrad exhausted his supply of Victrola records. He arranged with the Hamilton Music Store of Wilkinsburg to supply records in exchange for announcements of the store's name. Thus, the Hamilton Music Store became the world's first radio advertiser. H.P. Davis, Westinghouse Vice President, soon realized that a real radio industry lay in the manufacture of home receivers, and regular radio programs would make people want to own such receivers. Thus, a license was secured, and election night, 1920, was selected for the first regular broadcast. Some 30 million Americans are electing a president of the United States, a vice president, 34 United States... Senators. After that first broadcast, there were many other KDKA firsts to come. Spurred by an ambitious programming policy maintained by KDKA to this day, the plan called for programs of interest to the greatest number, distinctive feature programs scheduled at regular times, daily radio service, avoidance of monotony, and all of these promises led KDKA to break new ground. The first thing we did was uh, the Sunday morning services at the Calvary Episcopal Church in Pittsburgh. And in order to uh, operate the switches, we had to have a, a point where we could see what was going on. So we put the switchboard in the choir. In order to be in the choir, we had to wear the choir robes. And uh, I alternated with Jack Fraser, who was the head of the telephone department, who was a Catholic, and uh, myself. I'm Jewish, so we were in an Episcopal church. And sometimes when we were there, we'd sing along with the choir. That January 1921 church broadcast also marked the world's first remote pickup. In fact, 1921 was a year of many firsts, including the hiring of the world's first full-time radio announcer. I heard they were building this transmitting station, and uh, I went up to see it just through curiosity. And while I was up there, I found out that uh, they were looking for a regular announcer. And uh, I said, well, I'd like to try that. <laughs> So they let me try it, and apparently uh, it was uh, satisfactory. So I thought I'd do that for maybe a few days or a few weeks, and it ended up I was there five years. Harold W. Arlen also helped write the early history of sports broadcasting when on August 5, 1921, he first broadcast a Forbes Field match between the Pirates and the Phillies. To me, it was just like watching a regular ball game and announcing what happened. If we had known that we were really starting a history, we would have made some notes. <laughs> Did you, did you broadcast the play-by-play -play like they do today, or was it different? No, we do it like, pretty much like they do today, except we didn't have all the statistics. The Pirates won the game 8-5. to five. It was here that listeners first heard a world heavyweight championship fight. KDKA first carried tennis play-by-play, -play, the Davis Cup matches of 1921. And it was here that KDKA listeners heard the world's first radio world series, the Yankees and Giants from the polo grounds. Football play-by-play -play was born on KDKA when we aired the Pitt-West Virginia gridiron match on October 8, 1921. Pitt won it, 21-13. There were dozens more breakthroughs from the world's pioneer station, but the story of radio was just beginning. Our programming policies were beginning to cause some growing pains. As you know, uh, we just had a little shack uh, up on the... Uh, and only played phonograph music. So in order to get live entertainment, we built a studio right next to the radio station. The rooftop tent studio in East Pittsburgh caused some early problems for the performers, as Harold Arlen recalls. This... Uh soprano soloist came out all dressed up in evening clothes. She looked beautiful, but right in the middle of her song, a Pennsylvania train went by and blew a great cloud of smoke and soot all over her hair, her face, and her dress. She just kept on singing through the smoke and soot and finally finished her song. Early KDKA fans still recall the whistle of that passing freight train, which became a regular 8.30 p.m. feature no matter what the program. Our early radio schedule kept expanding. 
A program schedule of 1922, edited by Leo Rosenberg, lists a regular church program, the Uncle Wiggly bedtime stories for the kids, regular hourly news, weather, and announcements of the correct time. The KDKA Little Symphony Orchestra was the first of many musical groups on the station. By now, all of radio was growing fast. More than 500 broadcast stations were licensed in 1922. Meanwhile, in the Westinghouse laboratories, Dr. Conrad and others were still busy developing technology to bring the world such marvels as radar, FM radio, and television, and shortwave radio. Soon, a shortwave radio transmitter joined the KDKA transmitter on the East Pittsburgh rooftop, and the new equipment carried the programs worldwide. It wasn't long before KDKA inaugurated our famed Far North service. The Far North service was for many years the one personal connection to civilization for hundreds of missionaries, traders, Canadian Mounted Police, and others. Good evening. This is Bill Beale welcoming you once again to the regular Saturday evening program of Messages to the Far North. Well, here's tonight's first letter. It's to Alfred Cargill, Hudson's Bay Post at Moose Factory, James Bay, from your brother in Denver, Colorado. Alf, you will be happy to hear that Tom has pulled through the operation fine. And the 1925 marked the creation of national broadcasting networks, and KDKA joined the National Broadcasting Company as a member of the Blue Network. Coast-to-coast -coast radio entertainers were becoming household words. Billy Jones and Ernie Hare were two early radio singing stars heard on KDKA. How do you do, everybody? How do you do? It's great to say hello to all of you. I'm Billy Jones. I'm Ernie Hare. We're the into open there. How do you do? In 1928, KDKA moved its studios into the William Penn Hotel. Rudy Valley, Al Jolson, Eddie Cantor, Paul Whiteman, and many more all were heard on KDKA. And as radio's first decade came to a close, radio had become the cheerful friend during the dark days of the Depression, as the collapse of vaudeville created the new radio vaudeville era. Evening, fr fam uh, friends, family, I mean gang, I mean, uh, pardon me, ladies and gentlemen. This is station O-U-C-H of the New Writers Broad Trust. Uh, bro As radio became more sophisticated, so did the commercials. Singing commercials became much more common. Pepsi-Cola, it's the spot. 12 ounces, that's a lot. Price says much more a nickel, too. Pepsi-Cola is the drink for you. Have you tried with me? You will see them growing stronger every day, taking yeast as candy, handy candy way. It was in the early 30s that KDKA hired a young man from Beaver, Pennsylvania, Ed Shaughnessy. They said they would give us $10 a week if we would act out those little skits. And they would only last for about five minutes, but it was all part of the KDKA Kitties Club. We had a lot of fun, but uh, we at least got our foot in the door. But Ed Shaughnessy was just one of the many radio actors and performers during KDKA's early years, Bill Beal. And it was a little uh, acting job in a program called Pittsburgh Varieties. And incidentally, Ed Shaughnessy and I date back to the same day when we started. He and I auditioned together, and I got a talent fee of $2. We're in the money. We're in the money. We've got a lot of what it takes to get along. And it was then that Bill Hines joined the station as a part-time child radio actor, then full-time in the KDKA mailroom. But soon, Hines was promoted to a regular on-air position. With the KDKA orchestra in Glenn Riggs. And he stopped me one day and put me on the air and asked if uh, I could sing. And I said, well, I sing with my brothers. And he said, well, why don't you stop in sometime and sing a song for us? Well, that started the musical portion of my career. During the 30s, Slim Bryant came to KDKA. I worked on KDKA uh, every morning from 6 to 7 for 17 years, called the KDKA Farm Hour. And my group was known as Slim Bryant and the Wildcats with Loppy Bryant, my brother, and Al Azara, Jerry Wallace, and Ken Newton. Slim Bryant would later handle both a morning music show from 6 to 7 and an evening music program. His country music was popular on KDKA. Meeny, meeny, dixie, teeny, hit him a lick and Johnny Queen. 
Sweeney sing the kids when they go out to play. Double time, American time, 1899, this is the way that passed the time away. In 1934, KDKA moved to new spacious studios in Pittsburgh's Grant Building. Evenings on KDKA featured the shows on the National Broadcasting Company Network. The radio medium continued to demonstrate its superiority as a means of instantaneous news coverage, as heard in this famous 1930s eyewitness report of the Hindenburg disaster. Uh, just enough to keep it from... It burst into flames! Get out of the way! Get it started! Get it started! It's flashing! And it's flashing! It's flashing terrible! Oh, my, get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast and all the folks between that this is terrible. This is a, one of the worst catastrophes in the world. One famous radio news reporter began his career at KDKA just a few years earlier. Now, Lowell Thomas. Good evening, everybody, and thanks a lot, Hugh. I appreciated it all the more because another DuPont Award was made at the same time, given to what the committee considered the high-powered radio station that had done the most outstanding work for the past year. That station, KDKA, where I had my very first broadcasting experience just 21 years ago. In 1933, a national banking crisis led the president to use radio's intimate form of communication to talk to the nation. FDR's fireside chats were the forerunners of today's weekly radio addresses by President Reagan. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But KDKA Radio's biggest test was to come in 1936, when the Great Pittsburgh Flood forced the station to move from the Grant Building to emergency studios atop a hill while broadcasting went on. Pittsburgh, the heart of the metropolitan area that houses millions of people, is now living in the midst of conditions that have suddenly shoved the entire community back to horse and buggy days. We saw our usually peaceful and picturesque rivers, the Allegheny, Monongahela, and Ohio, suddenly changed to ugly, swirling, muddy monsters. 1937 marked the 17th anniversary of KDKA Radio. The station noted the event with a special broadcast from the William Penn Hotel that dramatically demonstrated how quickly radio had advanced in just a few years. At this moment, we are going to duplicate briefly a typical broadcast of those early days. You, our guests of the air, and our many guests here in the urban room of the William Penn Hotel in Pittsburgh are witness to this. As a small group of musicians, familiar to those who listened 17 years ago, play Avalon, a hit melody of 1920, and play it over the very same carbon microphones used on those initial broadcasts. <laughs> Engineering progress has outdated the 1920 microphone from which I am now speaking. Radio has made giant strides forward. In sharp contrast to the Avalon of 1920, played by the 18th group, comes the Avalon of 1937, with 60 of Pittsburgh's finest musicians under the leadership of Dr. Frank Black, musical director of the National Broadcasting Company. You hear it through the most modern of radio equipment. <laughs> All of radio was entering a new era, the era of big network radio shows. Coast-to-coast -coast radio was growing, and the crystal set and wireless telephone of the 20s had given way to the big friendly Philco, RCA, or Westinghouse radio in the family room. Evening was radio time, when listeners across the country would gather in front of the glowing dial for their favorite shows. And it's because of radio's power to enlist the imagination that many of yesteryear's radio programs remain fresher in the memory than last year's television shows. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Guiding light. Hello, Duffy's Tavern. Where do you leave me? Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Lux presents Bob Broadcasting from Grand Central Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Captain Midnight! Who knows what evil? Yes, it was a golden age of entertainment, and the 30s ended with the promise of great things to come. But overseas, there were rumblings that would soon explode into world conflict. Berlin. Adolf Hitler has warned the League that if sanctions are invoked against Italy, Germany will not observe them. Germany, which has given up membership... December 7th, 1941, arrived much too soon. Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. A date which will live... 
in infamy. America was at war, and here in Pittsburgh, the home front did its part. A big 18-ounce can of V8 vegetable juices takes only two ration points. You know, my husband's in a munitions factory now, and he gets his work shirts extra greasy. Well, my wife says Mrs. Davis down the road has lots of wartime work shirts to wash, too. We've had another week of air war. The greatest air war that the world has yet seen. Every bulletin met more information from over there, and the war left little untouched. KDKA's far north host, Bill Beale, explains. I can remember being called into the manager's office with uh, the previous week's letters and concern on his face, and somebody was there from, I suppose it was the FBI. Later they said that they were being used by the Nazis to send messages to their cohorts in America. Slim Bryant recalls those years. I do remember the good old days when KDK went to the bond rallies and all the public service work they did uh, to help the government raise money, uh, so war bonds. Uh, all the KDK staff with Bernie Armstrong and his group and Mary Martha Brown and the Kinder Sisters and Buzz and Bill and Faye Parker and Ed and Rainbow. As usual, KDKA listeners were there when the need was great. During World War II, KDKA sold our listeners over a million dollars in war bonds, both by huge outdoor bond wagon rallies and over the air to listeners in 31 states via mail order. Pittsburghers did their part and stayed by their radios. Listeners appreciated radio's ability to deliver instantaneous news of the battles overseas. But finally, the end of the war was in sight as radio bulletins came on a daily basis. It is evident to us here in the NBC newsroom that the first phase of the invasion has been carried through. And all Pittsburgh celebrated as Japan surrendered. KDKA's on the street reporter tried to describe the event over the noise of the celebration. Ladies and gentlemen, we're celebrating, all Pittsburgh is celebrating the end of the war in the Pacific. We're down here at 4th and Grant trying to get the various opinions from the folks walking by. Everyone seems to be in town, and I'm not kidding. So can't wait to stand the war was finally over, and the country got about the business of getting back to life as normal. Radio got back to the job of entertaining and informing as radio's entertainers returned from the front. Good evening, anybody. Here's more. Would you like to be... Daddy. Oh, what is it? <laughs> Faster than a speeding bullet. After a while, let a song be your style, you Mr. Anthony, are you ready for your first case? Quite ready, Eastern wartime. The Japanese have accepted our terms fully. Gangbusters. There was lots to do and see, and in Pittsburgh, that included Pittsburgh Pirates baseball. Those returning GIs couldn't wait to hear Rosie Rosewell. Any day, you don't need a raise or in that many. They're all close, clear out over the scoreboard. Over in the Shenley Park, a round triple for Ralph Kiner, his first of the 1948 season. Oh, did he? Let's hope that it's the first... Bob Prince was one of those who helped Rosie with his special effects. Rosie was the fellow that, if you knew his expressions, and they, and they certainly did in Pittsburgh, they loved him very much. He, uh, he was sort of the Edgar guest of the uh, baseball. Get up there, Aunt Minnie, raise the window, and the old dipsy doodle, and uh, get up and put a handkerchief on his head. Of course, I had to stand up there with a tray full of cowbells and glass and everything, and he'd blow the whistle, and he'd say, get up there, Aunt Minnie, and raise the window, and he'd blow the whistle, and he'd nod his head, and I'd drop the tray full of bologna. And all the debris go all over the studio. And then he, that sounded like breaking glass. And then he said, she never made it. Tripped over the garden hose. She never made it. A round tripper for Ralph Kane. Al Marsico's orchestra. Harry McCluskey and the Shag Level Cider Hounds. Bernie Armstrong and the KDKA Orchestra. These were just some of the musical groups on KDKA during the time. For the orchestra selection tonight, Al Marsico has chosen humorous. Evenings on KDKA featured live entertainment shows with studio audiences. Jeannie Baxter was a vocalist. Maurice Batoni led the band on, I think it was Tuesday nights for Fort Pitt there. And I was on uh, Friday night uh, with Bernie Armstrong, who was the leader, for Dick Hainbeer. Of course, Paul Shannon was the announcer, and uh, Mary Martha Briney, Maurice Batonley, and the Kinder Sisters. It's tap time! Yeah, I was on for Iron City Beer. Bill Hines was on for uh, Fort Pitt. 
and uh, Barney Armstrong and the KDK Orchestra was on for Duquesne Beer. And they were the three half-hour shows in the in the evening. Gypsy's love is like a melody Full of fire, my desire for you This is Bob Prince introducing the 404th Tap Time program presented by the makers of Fort Pitt Pilsner, Pitt Special, and Fort Pitt Ale, starring Maurice Pitalny with his violin and orchestra, the singing and whistling of lovely Faye Parker, the romantic voice of Bob Carter, delightful melodies by the Kinder Sisters, our charming singing star Mary Martha Branny, and as our guest, Bill Hines. Tonight's Tap Time program comes to you from the United States Army's Deshaun General Hospital at Butler, Pennsylvania, where we're entertaining an audience of some 1,500 of Uncle Sam's convalescing soldiers. Oh, you better watch out, better not cry, better not pout, I'm telling you why, Santa Claus is coming to town. Hear the reindeer on the roof, Santa Claus is coming to town. Buzz Aston and Bill Hines co-hosted the Buzz and Bill Show, as Buzz Aston recalls. And uh, this was pretty successful, and we had a lot of fun out of it. And then I had to go in the Army, and uh, Bill came in the Army a little bit later. We came out and got together again, formed a team uh, with the Buzz and Bill Show. Buzz and Bill also were heard in the morning on the Breakfast Cheer Show. And we did a 15-minute uh, Breakfast Cheer Show in the morning. Later, Bill Hines would go solo on the Brunch with Bill Show. <laughs> Won't you string along with us and have brunch with the bunch? It's a show that we think is a dilly. So go home and tell your dentist what a Monday, March the tentest. It's so silly when you're having brunch with Billy. <laughs> For your high noon hijinks, let's brunch with Bill. Thank you, Ed Shotzi, and welcome brunchers to 45 Minutes the Hard Way. And on hand for all this are Reet and Petite Elaine Beverly, Cousin Ewald with his garden gossip, Evelyn Succotash and her cookbook of the air, Bernie Armstrong and his orchestra, Ed King, and Snappos. The kids will go for their tangy goodness. It's the easiest breakfast food you've ever seen. Listen to what one mother says about Snappos. All the time my kids was beating their gums about what no good breakfast food they was getting. The poor little tykes didn't have enough energy to get out of the house because of no good breakfast food. And... Since you've been feeding them Snapple? They're out of the house and I ain't seen them since. <laughs> Mornings on KDKA featured the musical clock show with Ed Chauncey and his comedy sidekick Rainbow Jackson. Well, already it's time for us to say goodbye to you, Mom and Dad, and all the rest of the members of our musical clock family. Don't forget it's raining cats and dogs outside, so be very careful you don't step in the poodle on your way to work this morning. Yours truly, your getter-upper Ed Chauncey, wishes you the very best of a happy Monday. Our musical breakfast is transcribed from KDKA, your Westinghouse station in Pittsburgh. But soon, radio's dominance would be challenged by a rowdy newcomer. Ironically, thanks to Westinghouse developments in the lab, television was quickly becoming a significant challenge to radio. Families with a strange new box in their living rooms became host to entire neighborhoods as folks gathered before the flickering tube to see Uncle Milty or another popular show on the black and white screen. Oh, well, ho! Dee Doody kids and howdy, Buffalo Bob. Well, howdy, Mr. Doody. And boys and girls at home and kids in the gallery, let's go! Yeah. But strangely, radio welcomed the competitor, as KDKA's Bill Steinbach recalls. It was an amazing thing to hear radio stations advertising television shows that were going to be on the air that night. Somebody had failed to realize that at that point, anyhow, television and radio were deadly competitors. It was a new challenge for KDKA radio and for the radio industry. The world was changing again, and soon, so would radio. In Pittsburgh, the new WDTV, Channel 2, signed on in 1949. And in every household, the big radio sets in the family room were replaced by the big television sets. And radios moved into the kitchen, the bedroom, the car. Radio became portable. And instead of listeners coming to the radio, radio went to where the listeners were. And radio went to where the news was happening, too. The decision was made that perhaps it might be nice if you had the voice of the newsmaker on the air. 
Well, you needed a portable recorder to do that. Well, we had them in those days. They were called cup quarters. They were the size of a small suitcase. They were reel-to-reel recorders, not cassette types as we have now. During the early 50s, KDKA brought our listeners reports such as this broadcast from the scene of a mine shaft collapse. Okay, Mike, start the drill. Baby, are you late to the... During the decade of the 50s, KDKA and its staff made a bold move to adapt to the changing world of radio. It was 30 years ago when KDKA broke from the network and started fully independent broadcasts from our Pittsburgh studios. Gone were the radio soap operas and drama shows. A new young group of men with names like Reege Cordick, Art Fallon, and others came to KDKA, and the music was changing too. You ain't nothing but a hound dog, the crying old time. KDKA moved to our brand new Gateway Center facilities, joined by our new sister station, no longer WDTV, but with the new name, KDKA TV2. KDKA radio personalities became KDKA TV personalities. Ed Chauncey recalls how his Uncle Ed nickname came to be. And I'd say, come on, sit in Uncle Ed's lap. Oh, not you, Grandma, but just the kids. And they began to call me Uncle Ed. And that's where it happened on television, you see. It was 1954 when Uncle Ed and Rainbow left KDKA's morning show, and Reed Cordick took over. Well, there was uh, Carl Hardman, Bob Tro, and marvelous engineer Bill Steffen, and uh, oh, a number of other people, Sterling Yates, Charlie Swords, and uh, Bob McCulley did a lot of the writing. And we'd get together uh, two or three times a week in the afternoons to record pieces that were then used on subsequent shows. We'd Say, gang... Here's something you hear everyone saying these days, no matter where you are. At the baseball game. For sure I'd love to wear Bermuda shorts, but my knees are too bony. In the operating room. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, doctor, I'd love to wear Bermuda shorts, but my knees are so bony. Cordic and Company, forerunners of today's K-Team. Well, the same thing happened to the pioneering souls at the Cordic and Company Research Labs. And that's what led to their great invention, Bermuda Knees. With each of the characters, uh, I was always the straight man. I enjoyed being a straight man. And uh, with each of the characters, I had a different attitude. Uh, For instance, since you mentioned Carmen Monoxide, he was a punster. And my attitude toward Carmen was that he bored me to tears. You know, just leave me alone. Well, good morning, Carmen. <laughs> my, you're looking very effervescent. Well, Ray, did you ever see me when I ever wasn't? <laughs> <laughs> boy, oh boy. That's uh, going back a few years, isn't it, Carmen? <laughs> I'll say, Ray. Oh, speaking of going back, Ray, yeah. do you remember a kid we went to school with by the name of Nazi Hergerberger? Uh, wasn't he the one that sat behind Norina Franciscina in uh, Miss Stremenauer's homeroom? No, no, no. You're, you're thinking of Milton Butter. Well, how about <laughs> that? Bob Nazi Tro Hergerberger. talked about his voice characterizations with Cordic and Company. Well, we wrote uh, three days and recorded two. You were the voice of Carbon Monoxide, Max the Golf Pro, Broomhilda. Can you still do Broomhilda? Oh, uh, yes. I'll do it. Well, Broomhilda was, uh, had a fat lady's lodge, and uh, you had to be 350 to 720 pounds to belong to it. Cause you'll never get rid of them, no matter what you do. Oh, you'll never get rid of them, no matter what you do. Once again, we repeat, the football game scheduled for this afternoon between Pitt and Penn State has been canceled because of the snow. Here at KDKA, our emergency phone staff has been snowed under, too, with a staggering list of various social events that have been canceled, and it continues to come down. Now, here's the Ames Brothers' newest recording. The 50s also brought a fondly remembered show to KDKA listeners, Party Line, with Ed and Wendy King. Wendy, the interesting and unusual thing about the program was the fact that the callers that you had on this talk show program never went on the air. (laughs) Well, that was well planned and well thought out and stuck to, because we felt that that way we could use 
a lot more of an uh, audience's imagination. From 1951 to 1971, party liners listened faithfully to the show. And you see, we had some really strong personalities with us, too. People like uh, uh, Sterling Yates and Tom Bender and Adam Lynch and Paul Long and Al McDowell. Bill Burns stopped in once in a while. Meanwhile, Bob Prince was up in the booth calling it as he saw it. Anything that Jim and I have witnessed in this season absolutely at this moment pales into insignificance and we've had some thumpers here's the wind up and the one two pitch to Burdett foul off to the right out of play and Burdett has shortened up the grip on that bat and is trying to really hang in there and don't forget he also is quite a threat at the long ball two men down last half of the ninth inning no score I can't repeat it enough the one-two pitch. Stuck him out swinging. Haddock's pitch is a perfect nine inning. No hit, no run game. Art Palin came to the station in 1956. And with all the fuss that was in the newspapers, the letters to the editor and the various columns, Ed Chauncey talked to his audience. And he said, listen, here's a young man I've known for a long time. So give the guy a break, will you? <laughs> right, you want to tell him I about, sure do, you? Reed, I sure Go do, Go ahead, into the microphone. Huh? Hi there, this is your pal Palin. How are you getting along with your records today, Herman, old fella? Say, I've got some real big news for all you people. News that I'm sure will mean good listening for all of you KDKA fans. Now, for some time, Reed and Bob Tracy and I have been... There were other famous names on KDKA. Bob Tracy, Clark Race, and Sterling Yates. <laughs> Bill Steinbach joined the KDKA radio newsroom. Well, right here at KDK, as a matter of fact, is where broadcast journalism, I think, had its roots, as we know it today, with people on the street covering stories, that sort of thing. Another reporter at KDKA was Mike Levine, who lugged his mobile recording equipment to wherever the news was happening. Mike had been a reporter at the old Pittsburgh Sun-Telegraph, but quickly adapted to radio news. The sight of Mike with his equipment earned him the moniker, Mike Levine and his talking machine. Eventually, Mike Levine moved on to a new form of radio, telephone talk, where you could actually hear the caller. 1960 brought a World Series to Pittsburgh. And the Yankees have tied the game in the top of the ninth inning. Well, a little while ago, when we mentioned uh, that this one, uh, in typical fashion, was going right to the wire, little did we know. Art Dittmar throws. Here's a swing and a high fly ball going deep to left. This may do it. Back to the wall goes Barra. It is over the fence. Home run. The Pirates win. The 60s brought the Beatles to Pittsburgh and KDKA. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody having a ball out here at Greater Pittsburgh Airport. The plane has taxed into position. The step, the ramp are, is coming down. I can see a fairly good uh, line of sight view of the stairs. I guess I don't have to tell you. There they are. There's the Beatles. Today's KDKA program schedule found its roots in these years. Then the decision was made that maybe we ought to do a bona fide half-hour newscast, and we did it at 6 o'clock every evening. And it was 30 at 6 we decided it might be wise to back it up a half an hour, so we began to have news from 5.30 until 6, and it became 30 to 6. Then somebody decided that an hour would be better than a half an hour, and it became 60 to 6. And then somebody decided 90 minutes would be better than an hour, and we went to 90 to 6. Listeners will remember the familiar sound of KDKA News during those years. The 11 o'clock news has been presented by Revlon Incorporated, makers of those three famous products, top brass grooming aids for men, Tintex fabric dyes, and Esquire shoe polishes. Portions of the news pre-recorded, this is Jim White, KDKA News. We're going to hear from the singing nun in just a few seconds here on KDKA Radio. 
From, from the Art Talon Show. Is the time. It's 1.33, and here is the singing nun and Dominique. Dominique, 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 We interrupt this program with a bulletin from Dallas, Texas. President Kennedy has been shot. We repeat, a bulletin from Dallas, Texas. President Kennedy has been shot. The United Press says an unknown sniper fired at the presidential motorcade in Dallas wounding President Kennedy, perhaps seriously. The bulletin came over, it was a flash that came over the wires. And uh, they ran into the studio and they announced that uh, President Kennedy had been shot. We did not know at that moment whether he was dead or whether uh, how serious the, uh, the wounds were or a wound was. And uh, it was shock. And they came through with uh, immediate follow-ups on bulletins. And the 60s brought more changes to KDKA Radio. Reg Kordick moved toward new opportunities. I had an opportunity to, uh, to come out here to, uh, to KNX, CBS Radio, and uh, that wasn't quite as much fun as KDKA was, and I think I had just burned myself out, really, in the years. Taking over the morning for Kordick and Company on a short-term basis were Art Palin and Bob Tro. But it wasn't long before KDKA hired a new morning man from Montana, Jack Bogut. Jack Bogut, now on WTAE, was to handle the morning show until 1983. Sterling Yates had created a new form of Sunday morning radio show, carried on today by our own Trish Beatty. Sterling Yates' final Sunday morning show on KDKA. Well, sir, now, Eddie Arnold said there, it's got to be getting time. And it has got to be getting time. I could go from now to 5 o'clock, really, and thank all the people who have been so kind and cooperative and have helped me. And, uh... <laughs> KDKA celebrated our Golden Jubilee 50th anniversary in 1970. This is Jack Benny wishing KDKA happy birthday on their 39th year of broadcasting. And anybody who says KDKA is 50 years old is lying. They wouldn't dare start without me. KDKA Pittsburgh, listen to what we started. From the Gateway Center in the heart of the Golden Triangle in beautiful downtown Pittsburgh, this is Steve Allen asking the musical question. How's your client? Seriously, congratulations on KDKA's Golden Jubilee. And there were more changes for KDKA listeners. Ed and Wendy King's party line signed off in 1971. And John Cigna came to KDKA as the new 9 to Midnight talk host. The other place I worked at, across the street, which I won't mention any callers, WJAS, um... They were, they were changing from their talk and news and sports format to, uh, to rock. And I didn't want to work there. So I was going to go out to California and work in San Francisco. I didn't have any job, but I figured I could get a job in San Francisco. When Alan Mitchell, who was then the program manager here, called me and, in March and asked me if I'd like to come over here and work. I said, you know, Alan, that would be great because my kids aren't out of school yet. If I could work at KDK till June... This was March of 73 till June. That's beautiful. I won't have to pull them out of school, and then I can go to San Francisco. That was 1973, and I'm still here. I asked Alan Mitchell what kind of a talk show he wanted to do, and he says, you know, I'm really not sure. He says, why don't you, you just be you? Perry Marshall had been filling in for talk show host Jack Wheeler, but soon Perry became full-time. Jack Wheeler, uh, who did the all-night show, uh, was going on vacation for a few weeks and asked if I'd like to sit in. And I said, uh, yeah, sure, why not? Why not? Uh, so I, I came over and we talked, and uh, I said, what do you want me to do? He said, oh, there's a whole stack of albums in there. He said, play music, do whatever you want to do. I said, wait a minute, it's a talk show, isn't it? He said, well, yes. He said, have you ever done a talk show? I said, no. Uh, he said, do you know how? I said, I don't know. He said, you want to try it? I said, sure. He said, okay, go ahead and talk. And that was the beginning of Perry Marshall Talk Show Host. Perry Marshall, 1020, KDKA Pittsburgh. Names like Jim Horn, the Little Round Devil, 
Joel Zell and Terry McGovern were familiar ones to KDKA listeners as these personalities became well-known during the era. In 1975, Roy Fox replaced Mike Levine and the Fox's Den came to KDKA radio. I had heard through the grapevine that Ira Apple at KD was uh, my kind of person and was looking for uh, somebody to replace Mike Levine, so I sent a tape. And he invited me out for a couple of days, uh, putting me up in the penthouse basement uh, apartments at the Hilton Hotel. Let me pay all of my own expenses. He was my kind of guy. And we got along <laughs> fabulously. <laughs> it was in the 70s that Pittsburgh really became someplace special. Aaron Hill, Church Hill, Squirrel Hill, North Hills, Penn Hills, South Hills, Pleasant Hills, East Hills, North Side, South Side, Shady Side, and Troy Hill. Avalon and Bridge, Homewood, Hazelwood, Brentwood, Rushton, Dormont, Westview, Holiday Park, Bellevue, and Dorseyville. This is the Fox. Wherever I go around the Pittsburgh area, people come up and talk about uh, me and the rest of the people here at the station and what we do at KDK for the rest of Pittsburgh. But, you know, I've worked at a lot of places, a lot of big cities, a lot of big radio stations and good talent, and it just doesn't come together. I think the, the key to the whole mystery is because of people like you. KDK Pittsburgh, because of people like you. KDKA brought a new symbol to someplace special, a rainbow. And a new mobile studio called the Incredible Rainbow Machine allowed us to take our studio anywhere. Quite an improvement over that makeshift shack in East Pittsburgh that we used in 1920. Dave James came to KDKA in the early 70s, but not as a newsman. When I uh, first came to town, I was a television anchor man at a local television station uh, and uh, decided to get back into broadcasting. <laughs> I uh, came here doing uh, both record shows and news. Trish Beatty joined KDKA as a talk show hostess in the late 70s, but soon found a niche as afternoon personality. It was a warm June afternoon when I was lucky enough to get an audition uh, to come on the station. The Three Rivers Arts Festival was in full swing in downtown Pittsburgh. And I walked around the festival trying to collect my nerves. I was very, very scared of the audition. It was quite a momentous occasion in my young career. And I noticed that one after another, each of the car radios was blaring KDKA radio. It was in the late 70s that Uncle Ed Chauncey retired from KDKA's airwaves. Ed Chauncey has done many memorable things over the years on KDKA radio. Ladies and gentlemen, we present another preliminary broadcast in connection with our 718-foot antenna at Saxonburg being dedicated next Saturday, October 30th. This all took place back in 1937 when radio was a mere 17 years old. And Ed Chauncey, in his own mind's eye and that of the listener, took everybody back to the birth of radio in 1920. Come with us back 17 years and relive in memory life as it was in the 1920s. The same post-war years that we then thought so modern and so hectic, so exciting. Oh, boy. Dave James talks about the emotion of that final broadcast. When he finished his last broadcast, uh, he... Uh, controlled himself on the air, and when he, he gave his, his little goodbye speech, he just turned off the mic and threw his hands up in the air. It was just a, a very emotional moment, and, and then he clasped his hands to his forehead. Just, it was all over. And I remember the end of that last broadcast. I won't say so long, Mike, because I'll be seeing old Mike from time to time and saying hello to you if a sponsor deserves your trust you're the best friends a fella could have, with whom I visit every day, and strangely, paradoxically, whom I've never had a chance to meet. So, a heartfelt handshake to you men, and a kiss on the cheek to you ladies. Thanks. May life bring you as much happiness as you brought to Gertrude and me. So long, old friend. And to the rest of you folks, including my fellow employees, please try to understand just this little person-to-person -person chat. May I return you to the man 
from whom I've stolen this time. One of the finest men I've ever met in all my 48 years with this wonderful station whose call letters I've said with pride. KDKA, Pittsburgh, so long. So long, Uncle Ed. We love you. Not just Pittsburgh, but the entire broadcasting community will miss Uncle Ed. Dan Rather, CBS News. Good luck, Ed. KDKA and broadcasting were growing year by year, and 1982 was another historic first for KDKA as it became the world's first stereo AM station in a brief experimental broadcast hosted by Roy Fox. And, and, and what this means, historically we can say we are also the first AM station to go into stereo broadcasting. First time done on the AM band, and we'll tell you more about that as time goes on. And today, November 2nd, 1985, KDKA made history again when we began the first full-time AM stereo broadcasts in Pittsburgh. The 80s brought the K-Team to KDKA Radio as John Cigna took over the morning show from Jack Bogan. And in 1985, Art Palin retired from KDKA Radio. Forty-two and a half years ago, I spoke into a microphone and began what turned out to be a most enjoyable, fascinating, gratifying career called broadcasting. And it was always a great big love affair with a lot of laughs. I've always treated everyone who appeared on my programs as a star. Now, some were stars, and some weren't. But I always treated them as stars. I've met thousands of stars, especially when we reached out to you either during the Children's Hospital campaign or in the Rainbow Machine. Did you know, now think about this, did you know that the rainbow was the symbol of the covenant or agreement of God and Noah as the representative of all mankind, a promise that rain will always be followed by fair weather. Our rainbow machine symbolizes the covenant between KDKA and you, our listeners and our sponsors, that after any storm, we'll bring sunshine. We've informed you of tragic deaths and famine and war. We've shared joy and happiness. And what we do, we do better than anybody else because we work hard at what we do and realize the responsibility we have to you. We love doing what we do. The Lord has been good to us, and we know that the Lord has been working through us. I work with the greatest broadcasters in the business, and we've all grown together, including 13 managers and 23 program managers. And you've allowed me to be with you in your home with your family as you're riding your car. Accepting me as your pal is the greatest compliment I could have. Among the many things I have learned is that God's greatest gifts to us are not things, but opportunities. Opportunities to do things for other people. And on this last day on KDKA, would you join me in a daily prayer that I pray every day? Merciful Heavenly Father, when there's a need for teaching, teach through us. When there's a need for a message, speak through us. When there's a need for love, love through us. When there's a need for music, sing through us. When there's a need for understanding, listen through us. When there's a need for counseling, advise through us. When a gift is needed, give through us. Whenever prayer is needed, pray through us. When a helping hand is needed, reach through ours. Amen. Thank you. Remember, God loves you and so do I. God bless. Doug Hawks came to KDKA Radio in 1985, taking over the midday slot. Yours truly, Mike Pinsack, handles the 6 to 9 p.m. slot. And it's Criss Cross, 9 to midnight, and Perry Marshall, overnight, as we continue the tradition of evening talk shows on KDKA Radio. Bill Steinbach and Dave James are just two of the familiar names in the KDKA Radio newsroom. Fred Hansberger, Barbara Boylan, John Hadar, Bob Kometz, and Alan Jennings are others who carry on the tradition of news excellence which began at KDKA. Today, when you hear a KDKA newscast, you're hearing decades of experience and skill at work. Not surprisingly, KDKA Radio News hasn't changed the formula very much over the years. 2-2 pitch, driven to right away, back at the wall, it's gone! Shoots and scores! Mario Lemieux! Oh, hello! 
Hallelujah, Hollywood. From those early firsts in sports, the tradition continues with KDKA as the flagship radio station for Pittsburgh Pirates baseball and Pittsburgh Penguins hockey broadcasts. But what does the future hold for KDKA radio? Today, KDKA began broadcasting full-time in AM stereo. And whatever the challenges tomorrow may bring, KDKA will continue to bring you, our listeners, the things you've come to depend upon. We've come a long way in the past 65 years. Today, there are 355 million radios in homes. In fact, 99% of all households have radios. Almost half of the rooms in every home contain a radio. And radio has over 200 million listeners every single day. And it all began here. In the space of a lifetime, from crystal sets and cat's whiskers to satellite transmission, digital sound, and AM stereo, the world will never be the same because of what happened on this night in Pittsburgh 65 years ago. This is KDKA of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. KDKA Celebrates 65, produced and written by Chris Whitting. Additional production by Michael Watkins. Interview segments researched and produced by Frank O'Donnell. Some historic episodes recreated for continuity. Production assistance by Maureen Durkin, Judy Yankee-Fritzkis, and Harry O'Toole. This is Mike Pintek.